As Mike said, I'm Michael Capello. I'm the chair of the Epidemiology of Microbial Diseases Department here in the School of Public Health. And I also serve as the interim director for the Yale Institute for Global Health. So welcome everyone to the first of what I hope will be a regularly occurring event, which is the YIGH uh, Global Health Symposium. Um, this is really uh, a labor of love, uh, I think, on the part of all of us who've been uh, associated with the Institute. Um, and it's really something that I hope uh, all of you will find rewarding and informative. Um, we do have uh, nearly 200 people who've registered for the event, so I imagine over the course of the day, the room will sort of expand and contract, um, <coughs> which is uh, going to be a logistical challenge uh, on its own. Um, but I think we have a wonderful program. The, the purpose of this event today really is, is kind of threefold. First, we want to really highlight opportunities for faculty to engage in global health at Yale. So we'll hear about our seed grants, some of the pilot funding projects that we have uh, through panels. Um, we'll also get to hear about opportunities for students. Um, so we'll have Catherine Panterbrick, uh, who runs the Global Health Studies Program for undergraduates, will be here later today. But we also have our uh, Global Health Leadership Fellowship Program, which has been really successful. And then um, also our award-winning, uh, internationally recognized uh, Yale Global Case Conference team uh, will be here later today, fresh off their victory at the Emory competition. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sure they'll be sh sharing cash uh, with all of us from, from, from their winnings. And then third, we also want to help faculty and staff um, better understand some of the Yale policies and the way that global health work gets done here. The, the university has really put a lot of effort into uh, streamlining some of these policies. And so we'll have Stephen Wilkinson, who's the vice provost uh, for global strategy here later today, to help us kind of walk through some of these challenges. It's really an important area, and I would say one of the, the most important things that the Institute has tried to do over the past uh, year. Um, but mostly this is about celebrating global health, right? Um, I think all of us who've been working in this uh, field, uh, some of us for many, many years, um, we've wanted this opportunity, I think, to come together. We're always looking for like-minded people, members of our community, if you will, uh, to come together and to celebrate. And I hope that that's the message that you'll hear today. We have uh, a wonderful uh, set of lightning talks at the end of the day to give just a brief glimpse into some of the amazing breadth and depth of work in global health, and so I hope you'll stay uh, for that. And so to anchor our day, uh, we're really privileged to have with us Professor Madhu Pai from McGill University, who will deliver our keynote lecture. Um, <clears throat> I, for one, am really looking forward to this opportunity. Professor Pai is really a leading voice in global health, and he's certainly uh, someone that we should all be paying attention to. If you follow his advice, you won't just be better at your job, you'll be a better person. So uh, Professor Pai, we're really looking forward to having you here. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Megan Ranney, who's the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health and the Winslow Chair, to come up and say a few uh, welcoming remarks. Thank you, Mike. Um, and thank you to Michael Skanetsky as well, as well as to all the other staff who did such a great job organizing today. Um, it is a true pleasure to be here to welcome you to the Global Health Symposium. For those that don't know, my own career in medicine and public health actually started in global health. I finished undergrad and went uh, to Cote d'Ivoire, where I spent two and a half years as a Peace Corps volunteer, dropped in as a 21-year-old uh, who had graduated from Harvard with a history of science degree to supposedly fix water and sanitation for the village that I was living in. If there is ever an example of how global health goes wrong, it was that. <laughs> I ended up actually working on the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, it was the late 90s. Uh, Ivory Coast was the epicenter of transmission of HIV in West Africa because we were a major trucking route um, down to the coast. And of course, at that point, no antiretrovirals were available in West Africa as compared to in the US where we had them amply available by that point thanks to the work of ACT UP and, and others. Um, and that was really the genesis of my decision to go into medicine, because at that point I did not know that public health existed, into emergency medicine with the goal of returning uh, globally and living and working in the communities that I cared about, um, and my work on violence prevention because of the impact of gender-based violence on transmission of HIV. I have ended up not working in global health, um, partly because of a lot of the things that Madhu is going to talk about this afternoon. 
I believe strongly that we have an obligation to be part of the communities that we work with, whether in medicine or in public health. And because of the way that my life took me, who I married, having kids, I couldn't go and spend significant amounts of time in the countries that I cared about. And I felt that the last thing that I wanted to do was to recreate my Peace Corps experience of parachuting in, claiming that I had solutions, being listened to simply because I had appeared from elsewhere, and then disappearing and leaving people to figure things out on their own. I will never forget the images of all the different kinds of pumps across my area of Cote d'Ivoire that had been put in by different aid agencies that they had no ability to fix, right? And to me, that's the, the image of global health that we don't want. The image of global health that we do want is one that's bi-directional partnership, that's informed by rigor, by deep community understanding, um, and by a commitment to learning from each other. I would also posit that in many ways, global health is domestic health. We can do just as important work down the street in New Haven as we can if we go back to the village that I lived in in Cote d'Ivoire. And I know that many of you in this room are living that, recognizing that the actual work that we are doing is trying to create health as a public good and as a human right, rather than kind of this idea of somehow we have to go elsewhere or other the work that we do. I'm going to quote from a Lancet article from 2010 that my fellow Dean Linda Freed and others wrote, although unfortunately it was only American deans that wrote this article. Um, but she said that global health is public health, and public health is global health for the public good. And I would expand that by saying that global health is health. As we come out of the COVID pandemic, I think we would be hard pressed to imagine that there is any aspect of health that is limited by geographic boundaries, whether it is infectious, non-infectious, climate change, mass migration, social media and misinformation, the decrease in trust in science and health professions, or of course the rise in dengue, in multi-drug resistant TB, um, in all of the vector-borne diseases that many of you work on, all of this crosses geographic borders. And what I'm so excited about today is that chance to share knowledge, to share lived experience, with the goal of elevating the entire discussion, the entire scientific enterprise, and the health of all. So the last thing that I'll say is that one of the things that also excites me about today, and why I'm so proud of Michael Capello for stepping up as interim director of YIGH this year, and of the entire team and all of you, is because in public health and in global health, we can't fix things if we work in a disciplinary silo. And so public health can't work alone, certainly biostats, epi, behavioral and social science can't work alone, Medicine can't work alone, and it's not neurosurgery versus pediatric surgery versus gen surge versus ortho, right? But we also need to work with others from across Yale, with folks from global affairs and anthropology and sociology and econ and architecture, right? They all have a role to play in making the world healthier. And so by creating this symposium today, you've really created a space, um, Michael and team, for folks to come together to create new cross-collaborative solutions and hopefully to incite new innovations that will take the world by storm and change the health of populations. So my last comment is just how excited I am to welcome Dr. Maru Pai. He and I have known each other for years, originally through Twitter, although I'm no longer on Twitter. Um, co have corresponded extensively, have written for each other, um, and I consider him a friend, but I had actually never met him in person until yesterday. <laughs> so I just am beyond grateful um, to have him here joining us at Yale. Um, I will unfortunately be missing the talk this afternoon because we have uh, the Thorn Prize for Startup Health Yale this afternoon, which is also global health. Unfortunately, got scheduled at the same time and I have to go over there. Um, but Maru, what, what a joy to welcome you and I can't wait to watch the recording of your video. With that, I am going to hand it over to the amazing Christina Talbert Slagle, who will be leading our first session on sparking global health innovation at Yale. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here. Thank you, Dean Ranney and Professor Capello, for those amazing remarks. I am here this morning to talk with you about our work to spark global health innovation at Yale. So within the Yale Institute for Global Health, we have more than 200 
affiliated faculty. These are faculty from all across the campus at various levels of rank, with various levels of specialization and academic interest, who have all come together to say, we want to be part of what is happening in global health at Yale, which is very exciting. In my role, I'm honored to direct what we call the Faculty Support Initiative. So I'm going to share with you our overarching objectives of that initiative, and then hand the floor to two of our star faculty um, whose innovation we've been able to help support. So we think about, as it says here, leveraging for impact and launching bold initiatives. So one of the things that we know is among our faculty there are so many brilliant ideas, amazing collaborations, also lots of humility and interest in elevating the voices of partners globally through what Yale offers. And so we thought about how can we support and, and elevate our faculty and their partners. So we have designed what we call seed grants to support promising ideas, giving lots of room for faculty to just think broadly and then help catalyze what they want to do. There are faculty networks here. Um, as it says, based on thematic or country interests, that work is led by my colleague Jeremy Schwartz. And we also have thought very hard about how we can work behind the scenes at Yale to help make global health work easier. Yale is based in the US. It has lots of administrative processes. Many of those have been developed to address domestic issues, which are sometimes not the best processes for addressing work that's happening beyond the US. So we do a lot of behind the scenes work. We'll talk more about that later today. So two seed awards we've developed, and we're really proud of these, and, and even more proud of those who've received them and the great work that they've done. Uh, the first one is called, <coughs> excuse me, the Spark Awards, which is to spark innovation. Um, we created it to support any of our YGH affiliated faculty as they identify, coordinate, and or prepare for global health work. So it's deliberately broad. We know there are great ideas out there. Tell us what they are, and we want to support you. Um, as it says, and we love the name, spark a larger scope of work. Here you can read this, I won't read this to you, but we, the way we do this is we ask for very short proposals. We have up to $10,000 per award. We have a review committee, each application gets read twice, they get scored, and then we award two or three every year. Um, we've had faculty from across Yale, working across the world, receive these awards, and one of our recipient faculty will be here to tell you how she leveraged that for additional work. Then the other C grant we offer is called the HECT Global Health Award. Um, it was established at Yale long ago from a generous gift from our actual faculty colleague, Dr. Robert HECT. Um, this one is more about groups. So it's open to our faculty network. So these are the groups that have come together around thematic or country interests, and we want to support their collaborative work. As Dean Ranney said, global health transcends any disciplinary boundaries, and we want to support the way that people have creatively come together to do that. Um, so it's open to existing faculty networks through YGH. We require that faculty from two different schools be participating and also acknowledging the support of training. People have to have a student or a trainee as part of their budget. Um, these are up to $50,000 and teams apply and we give one or two of these every year. So we will hear from Professor Jeanette Ikovix, who was a HECT recipient about how she did the work. We have timed the launch of the Spark and HECT Awards to happen right now as of today. These are open. We are encouraging everyone to apply. Please share with us your great ideas. And if you don't get one this year, just keep applying. We are very excited to learn what faculty are doing individually and collectively and to support you. So here's the timeline. Um, and we hope that we're flooded as of you know, very soon. The deadline is May the 5th. Um, so let me now hand it over to my colleague, Amy Bay, to tell you about the wonderful work that we were able to help support. Thank you. All right, so thank you so much, Christina. Thank you so much to all of you. It's such a pleasure to be here. And again, to really be able to share how the Spark Awards have impacted our work, but beyond our work specifically, the, the impact of our team um, with our ultimate goal of leveraging genomics to accelerate malaria vaccine discovery. All right, so the, the overall idea that we had and the project that we've been working on has been to use genetic and genomic approaches to inform malaria vaccinology, but really through this very unique lens of insights that we can gain from the field. 
The goal of this project was to identify novel antigens for malaria vaccine discovery and also validate and credential those antigens using a reverse vaccinology approach that combines genomic and transcriptomic data to make sure that our vaccines are really adapted to the, the unique and diverse parasite strains that are circulating in the areas that are most affected by the disease. So these were sort of the goals of the project. Um, so we really wanted to be able to understand in real time and in place which variants of the, the next generation vaccine candidates that we've been working on are critical to consider when maximizing vaccine efficacy. We really want our, our next generation malaria vaccines to be able to work no matter what parasite strain you're infected with. And so this was really one of the goals was to do this in an upfront way as part of, again, vaccine uh, discovery and credentialing. This information can then feed in to optimize current formulations in the face of these globally diverse parasite variants, paving the way for a more broadly effective malaria vaccine that doesn't succumb to the challenges of strain-specific immunity. And embedded within these research goals is really our ultimate research goal, which is to support our young emerging scientific leaders, our African scientists, to pave the way in vaccine discovery, production, testing, and implementation. So every stage along the vaccine development pipeline to really contribute to the next generation of vaccines for malaria. So this is just a big picture overview of the project and the work that we do. Um, it really all begins and ends um, at every step of the way in malaria endemic populations. And shown here is really just the example of the work that we've been doing in Senegal. So we start in Senegal in the disease endemic setting. We're able to use the immune responses that have been generated from vaccinees in early stage clinical trials. And we test these ex vivo with patient isolates directly from infected patients to really understand if there are particular variants that are um, able to escape the activity of these immune responses. Using this information, we then can sequence the parasites that are involved in this process um, through genomic sequencing pipelines that we've implemented in country. And then we can use that information to look and see, are there particular genetic variants that are able to escape this immune response? We then can leverage different kinds of downstream processes from biochemistry to structural biology to genome editing to really test these hypotheses and better understand which specific mutations or which specific strains are resulting in um, immune evasion. And then finally, we take this information back to the field and to our functional testing. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the story of how this SPARC Award has impacted the research that our team is doing. And again, I'm so incredibly grateful for this award. It came at a really critical time for us. Um, we were applying for funding to try and fund this project. We had, uh, we had applied to an NIH grant and had received favorable reviewer feedback, but really needed to generate some additional data to kind of expand on the approach that we were proposing. So this, this SPARC Award really came at the perfect time that was able to help us um, kind of leverage and catalyze and generate this necessary preliminary data. Additionally, you know, I've been working in Senegal for, for decades, and we also wanted to really expand this approach, not only to be so deeply focused on Senegal, but to many of our partner African countries that have been involved in this partnership. So this allowed us to really expand this approach to additional countries, and this has also impacted our ability to increase training activities there. Ultimately, the, the great news is that this resulted in a favorable outcome for our award. So our R01 was funded. This is an R01 focusing on evaluating the functional impact of genetic diversity in vaccine candidates. But I will say that this was just the first of many positive impacts of this SPARC award. So through the preliminary data, through the activities, other members of our team um, in Senegal have been able to apply competitively for funding through the African Academy of Sciences, through the African Union, the European Union, to actually fund their work as they move through their own career development as emerging leaders. And then in looking to the future, part of this R01 being funded, as well as these other awards, is that we're hoping to apply for an upcoming Fogarty D43 training grant along these themes. And so this has been something transformative of well. And we're, the, the theme of this uh, training grant will be African innovation and vaccinology. So again, I just want to emphasize how truly grateful I am for, for this award, for the impacts that it's having on our team as a whole, and in our ability to um, implement these challenging approaches in disease endemic countries with partners there. So thank you so much.
<laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, Sten. Go back to your map. Yes. Can, can you tell us what all those colors mean, green and uh, orange? Absolutely. So the, the red are the, starting in Senegal, are the countries where we have active genomic surveillance that's happening every year. The, the green countries are those countries where we have the ability to conduct con genomic surveillance from cross-sectional studies. And the yellow countries are countries in which we have access to data that's been generated collaboratively where it can really inform the genetic strains that are circulating. And again, I think probably embedded in your question is one of the things we've been really thrilled about is that through this SPARC award, through this R01, we've actually been able to incorporate Chad as well as some of these other partner countries in this project, which has been a real goal. So thanks for the question, Sten. Yes? Amy, that's fascinating. Does the genotype of the parasite and the immune response also relate to who does or doesn't get cerebral malaria? That is an excellent question. In our particular studies so far, all of our um, enrolled individuals have uncomplicated malaria. Severe malaria is actually not a part of this particular study. However, that is something that we take into consideration in terms of the clinical trials and in terms of the efficacy of those vaccines downstream. So that's something that we will be looking at prospectively as we're partnering with the, the clinical trials that are going to be ongoing in these upcoming years. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Yes? Um, Amy, I think you, you've uh, sold yourself a little short on the degree to which your program has really embedded training of uh, uh, African scientists. Could you just talk a little bit about the impact that, that, that it's had on Absolutely. Um, yes, I think that that is something, the training aspect and the partnership is really something that is fundamental in the work that we do. Um, none of this work could be done in isolation. I think Dean Rianney's example in the beginning in terms of how we approach global health research is so, is so critical. And so I think I've been so fortunate to be a part of a really dynamic and vibrant team of young scientists in Senegal. And that has really been additionally a huge priority for us is to make sure that those young scientists are supported in their own career development and in the goals that they want to do. This is something that is not always easy. There are often various structural barriers in place for them in terms of gaining independence and going on to lead their own groups. And so this is something we've really been trying to support them. And again, I think that was why you know I was so grateful for this award is that it not only did it help our team more broadly, but even those individual scientists and being able to achieve their own goals was something that was really, um, really formative. So, yes. All right. Thank you so much. Amy, that is so impressive. Congratulations. Um, I think if you just take these, if you count these as the first two mini talks or the third and fourth speakers, um, between Amy's basic science work and this important work in Africa and vaccine development and malaria, I've been working with a global network at the policy level um, in, in urban, uh, urban issues. And this is the Resilient Cities Network. Um, there are about 100 cities all around the world in low, middle, and high-income countries. And we've had the, the pleasure of working together and building health into their portfolio. Resilient Cities Network is, has been focused for over a decade on climate change, and in particular, um, what I call sort of bridges and roads and infrastructure. Uh, the executive director is a development economist. It is headquartered in Singapore, where I was for almost five years. And before I left, I said to them, are you interested in integrating health into your portfolio? And the response was, sounds good, sounds interesting, but it's really not up to us. It's up to the cities. So I came back after four and a half years there as um, dean of faculty, came back to Yale, and really decided to shift my work from, in many things, many ways, what was hyper-local, um, developing care, uh, Community Alliance for Research and Engagement in New Haven, having spent five years in Asia Pacific, thinking I really wanted to 
think about global and global health. So the $50,000 HECT award really was, as with Amy, transformative. It enabled us to develop a partnership and to really just lay the, you know, I would say a bit more formative than what you're doing, but really just lay the groundwork for um, exploring the ideas, exploring them with um, uh, folks from around the world, but also from across the university. And so part of the SPAR, uh, part of the HECT award, as Christina described, is that you need to have faculty and students from more than one school. So we were uh, working uh, with folks from here, at School of Public Health, School of the Environment, School of Architecture, and the School of Nursing. So our goal, overall goal is to cultivate urban resilience and health to increase the capacity of systems and individuals to thrive despite acute shocks and chronic stressors of climate change. And uh, like Amy sharing a few milestones, we were able to complete a survey and report um, among the cities in the network to identify their climate and health priorities. Uh, part of HECT, again, is that training component, a deep training component. So we were working, we were able last summer to place students in five cities across the network, and that included um, Athens, New York City, Athens, uh, Malay uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Singapore, and Manchester. And we obtained funding. We were able, uh, like Amy, to leverage this funding to additional funding. So we are about halfway through a, uh, a what do we call a scoping project that the Rockefeller funded. And on Wednesday, some of you have heard me um, talk about this because it's been a, it was it was quite a quite a heavy lift. But on Wednesday, we submitted a three point two million dollar grant to Welcome Trust. We had submitted last year, we were finalists, so we're hoping in 2024 we'll break through. And again, just express my gratitude to Robert Hecht specifically and to the Yale Institute for Global Health um, as well. So our initial goals were uh, for this Rockefeller funding, so building from Hecht, is as I said, a scoping project on health and climate. They want us to focus on low and middle income countries. So we're focused in the network across Asia, uh, Latin America, and Africa to identify evidence-based programs and policies that we can scale up. We're looking to disseminate and amplify results. Uh, we actually launched, the program is called Urban Pulse. We launched it at COP28 in Dubai. We, are, uh, we will be meeting next month in Mexico City uh, for a knowledge exchange. And there we'll be starting to collect materials for a global campaign that's, that Resilient Cities is um, part of called Cities Solve, Cities Deliver. They have done two global campaigns, one in energy and one in water, and this will be the health global campaign. And so we'll begin uh, collecting uh, those solutions and stories um, May 15th in Mexico City. And again, our long-term goal is to obtain funding. We did get this Rockefeller funding. We've got the welcome underway, and we'll, we'll, uh, we also, uh, to the extent that domestic is global and global is domestic, we did just get a cities grant in the United States um, from NASA. I never imagined standing here as professor of public health. I would get a NASA grant, um, but with Clara Pregitzer from the Natural Areas Conservancy and Karen Sito from School of the Environment and others, we'll be looking at remote sensing to green space. And um, these are actually funding, it's interesting, it's funding from the, in, um, from the uh, what's the IRA, the, Reduction Act, the, Act. thank you, the Inflation Reduction Act. See, inflation's not a big deal anymore, right? The Inflation Reduction Act, and so there's a, a environmental justice, e health equity component. And so Karen called me and said, I think, I, I think health could be the bond between um, remote sensing and environmental justice. And I said, of course, health can be the bond. So we'll, we just got funding and we'll be working across 20 cities in the US and resilient cities will also be a part of that. 
So very quickly, I'll just share a little bit um, from th these surveys were just done. These are the newer set of surveys. They were just done uh, last month. We had, uh, we had about 180 respondents, so there could be more than one per city. Uh, identifying a need for urgent action. The challenges are no surprise to anybody working in the climate space or climate and health. Heat, flooding, should be a comma there, food insecurity, mental health, and of course dengue and other infectious diseases. Um, there was an identification, of course, of vulnerable populations, particularly children and older adults. And along with these profound challenges was a recognition of, frankly, just I would call moderate readiness, and I think that's a bit generous. Um, we asked respondents on a scale of zero to 100 percent, where zero is not at all ready and 100 is completely ready, how ready are you, how prepared are you to handle climate emergencies? And the, this is, you know, obviously just a quick indicator, but they said 40, 40.3 40 percent to be exact on average. Only 27 percent of cities have a resilience plan that actively integrates climate and health really not surprising in a way, given how siloed sectors have been and how health has not been involved. So these are climate plans that, that frankly, have not integrated health. So um, because I am dispositionally optimistic and I think about these as opportunities, clearly this provides a, a great opportunity for us to um, bring health into the dialogue and, uh, more importantly, to bring health into the plans, the policies, the programs that will create better readiness and will create more resilient um, uh, people and, and cities and the planet. Um, this last bullet here, or last set of bullets, is something, depending on this question, between 24 and 38 percent said that they had access to climate forecasts to inform pu public health decisions, they had prevention strategies to avert risk, early warning systems, and or, and or emergency response plans. So again, indicating not... Uh, really not um, sufficient readiness, despite it being 2024 and so forth. So again, lots of opportunities. Um, I won't go through this, but you know, I guess we all have to have some complicated something or other <laughs> um, as a slide, but um, basically this is the logic model that went into the welcome grant that was submitted on Wednesday. And again, we, I, I love the, I personally love the logo, Urban Pulse. You can see the cities, you can see the green and blue, the people, the cities, the sort of green and blue um, planetary health focus. And here we are focusing on inclusive policy development to promote health and climate resilience in Latin American cities. So we're really going to do a much deeper dive in um, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, Montevideo, and Rio de Janeiro, which we will kick off next month. As I said, we're meeting in Mexico City. There'll be 10 cities from across the global network, including these four plus two each, three each from um, Asia and Africa. And then we'll do some assessment and policy development in a poetic turn of events. And I have to thank Michael. Um, Michael, he suggested connecting with Robert Hecht again, and, and Robert has agreed uh, to do some cost effectiveness and cost benefit analysis with us, which I think will be important in moving ahead on the policy development side. And then the idea and the goal is, and this is part of what Welcome wants, is the opportunity to scale up. So we propose a deep dive in Latin American cities and then the opportunity to amplify and scale up across the global network. And our <coughs> overall goal, of course, is to improve health and promote equity through climate action in cities. So sincere thanks to the Yale Institute for Global Health, the HECT Faculty Network Award, and, uh, and all of you. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. So we are first, the, 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 the proposal that we submitted last year, we were guided by an initial survey and we selected cities from across the world, two cities in each of five continents that expressed the greatest interest in the health climate interface and had some infrastructure that would enable us to, to go, you know, to do that work. Welcome said, I don't think we, you don't, we didn't think we could, you can do this in across this global 
sort of scenario in three years, so you should fo you know, hope, focus down. So we picked Latin America, and we picked these particular cities, again, because of their interest, because of their engagement already in Urban Pulse, because they are politically stable cities right now. Um, they have some infrastructure, and the regional director uh, for Latin America in Resilient Cities Network, Javier Gardino, is, uh, you know, is really was willing to, and the mayor of Mexico City, I should say, is actually really willing to put effort and some um, you know, resources in, into this. So we think it's the place that will give us the greatest chance of success and a strong platform for scaling up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Great work. Um, Montreal last uh, fall got uh, 80 millimeters of rain in two hours. Oh. And massive flooding that nobody has ever seen before. And residents sued the city. The city's response is no city in the world is set out, designed to deal with that amount of rain in such a short period of time. Wow. I think this is probably the future now. The weather patterns are such that these intense bomb cyclones or whatever you call them are dumping enormous amounts of water. And so I can't even wrap my head around how any city in the world can possibly deal with that kind of biblical deluge, <laughs> right? So I think your, the work is, is extremely important. And I hope you will also look at cities that have really recurring floods, for example. That seems like you can do something. There must be some way to help people, as opposed to these sorts of deluges that nobody can probably do anything much about. You know, one of the things that's interesting about working with the network, and I have to admit, I some day, many days, I feel like underwater myself in thinking <laughs> about these huge challenges and working at the policy level. Like, if you ask me, my background is a social behavioral scientist. Like, I could design a randomized trial and think about ways to, um, you know, have more targeted interventions and um, populations and specific metrics for health outcomes. So this is, for me, is really hard work thinking at the, at the city scale level. But it's also very exciting, and, and you're mentioning floods. So Resilient Cities Network has regional headquarters, and in Europe, it's Rotterdam. And so, and Swiss Re and Z Zurich are, um, are big funders and involved in this work. And so obviously we can take, and I'm excited to hear your talk too, but mm -hmm. thinking about the north-south interface mm -hmm. and learning from Rotterdam, which of course has a lot of technical knowledge and infrastructure, whether it's to bring that those solutions to Quebec or to bring them to um, you know, coastal cities in Africa and Asia. Um, you know, I think there's great promise here, and it's it's quite effortful. But I'm I'm up for the challenge, and it's with with this kind of support and collaboration that I think we'll hopefully have some impact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeanette. That was just, oh. thank you so much, Jeanette. That was fascinating and so impactful. Um, you know, you sort of alluded to it, but I was going to ask if you could give us a snapshot of what it looks like to work with different cities, and who on the ground are you actually collecting the surveys from? And when you place students, who it is that yeah. they're working with? Because I imagine it's so diverse and, like you alluded to, just very complicated to navigate. So I can answer. Let me sort of almost take the questions backwards. Yeah. So, or middle, and the middle, the last two. <laughs> the main partners are the mayors and chief resilience officers. So this, the history of the, what, what is now the Resilient Cities Network is 100 Resilient Cities, which came out of the Rockefeller Foundation originally. So again, there's this, um, you know, uh, cha chapter, these chapters that are connected, the story, its narrative is connected. So the chief resilience officers are really our main people. And again, they're more on the environmental side, climate, sustainability. So now we're pushing out to more health directors and um, uh, departments, and, and it's now in this year, the second year, that we're able to think about more multi-sector involvement. But it's mayors and CROs, and that's where the students have been working. What I'm really looking forward to in this survey, we had a lot of um, open-ended questions, and Mexico City will start to really dig in, are to think about what some of the really specific solutions are one of my 
favorites, and it might not be, you know, it, there's so many. And uh, first of all, Latin America, I think we'll hear later, but like dengue and all the vector-borne diseases, it's really hard to think about any solutions um, or anything related to global health and climate and not talk about that. We want, I'll just give you one last one, and so, so that's, that's certainly uh, an area. There are food systems, some food systems work that's happening. Heat is a really big one, and probably I, what I'm hoping for is a small pocket of funding in a private-public um, uh, connection with the Sustainable Markets Initiative on green schoolyards. And green schoolyards, I think, are really interesting because they can be used for heat adaptation, um, also can be used to collect water, creating, um, uh, you know, le getting rid of concrete and creating more uh, water um, uh, durability. And then, but they're more than that, and it's more than the children, because the children are connected to their families, and of course the teachers and staff at the schools, but also the neighborhoods and the communities, and using those schools as, um, as resilient centers. So I'm, I'm excited about that, and I think what, what, again, what we'll do, and this is hard for me in a way, but it's really important, and I think it speaks to what uh, Megan and, uh, was talking about and, and Mike, is really allowing the cities to identify the priorities and to being responsive with evidence-based solutions that hopefully we can have a measurable impact. So, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for all of your time.